What's going on, everybody? It's How To Tuesday, and we've got a really good one for you today. My friend Mike Larkin and I were talking about boats, and we were talking about the difference between a skiff and a bay boat. He's got a lot of questions about how to make that choice for himself, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but this is a question that I get all the time. The Miami Boat Show is coming up. I'm leaving for the Miami Boat Show tomorrow. This is going to be a question that I'm going to be answering all weekend. So I thought this would make an excellent How-To Tuesday um, because you probably have similar questions. So, Mike, what's going on today? How you doing? Good, good. You? I'm doing great. Just got back from this awesome trip in, uh, in the British Virgin Islands, did a little sailing, a little fishing. It was fantastic. Loved it. Um, all right. So you're thinking about maybe choosing between a bay boat and a skiff. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I'm more familiar with the skiff back in Miami had an, uh, 18 foot, um, dolphin super skiff yeah. and, and pulling. And then I moved over to the Tampa area, which I feel is like, um, like the, the trolling motor capital of the world. Like everyone <laughs> over here has a trolling motor. Uh-huh. So, and I'm, and I'm very inexperienced at fishing with a trolling motor. So I want to pick your brain more about, um, I'm, I'm more familiar. I, I love skiffs. Um, you know, they're, you know, the pulling, the, the quietness, um, the dexterity you can spin, you can move. Um, although I've had, certainly had some frustrating times pulling a boat. I'm sure you have too. Like it's a two person or more game. Like right. if you're out there by yourself, it could, it could be miserable. And I've, I've really struggled trying to chase fish pulling by myself. So I'm thinking, you know, these bay boats and over, I, Reverend, or I am where everyone has a trolling motor. So I want to pick your brain. So when you're, when you, you have a bay boat, right? You have a 24 foot yes. bay boat. Am I yep. right? Yep. And a so, skiff. So, so when you both and a skiff too, got you, but you're my hero. You got both. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, so can you really stalk, for example, I always think in terms of bonefish, uh, can you really stalk bonefish on a trolling motor or is it more like you go to an area and you kind of put your power pole down or put your anchor down or whatever, you're kind of going to spots. You're not really mm-hmm. stalking them with a trolling motor. You can absolutely stalk them with a trolling motor. I've caught so many bonefish and permit and tarpon with the trolling motor. Um, there is a technique to it. You can't just go on high and you know and and expect that they're going to to allow that. So if you run the trolling motor very low and and it is not cavitating. So the blade is staying completely underwater and you're running it on low. I think it may be quieter than polling. Um, and you can get okay, okay. right on top of them, especially if the wind is blowing hard. Um, one of the things about polling is that every time the pole touches the bottom, it makes noise, right? So even if you're in a, in a mud bottom, so you're making noise. A lot of times I think... This is just my own personal uh, theory, but I think that a, a lot of times the last thing a fish hears before it's been caught for the last 40 years is a pole, is the pole touching the ground, right? <laughs> and then they get caught. Mm-hmm. And so they tend to be pretty spooky when they hear the pole slide across the bottom or even, you know, a good, very experienced guide is very careful about how they put the pole in the ground, a lot of people use wood feet um, for this purpose. They'll they'll make one out of a mangrove or um, something like that to to quiet that down. But you're still touching the bottom with the trolling motor. You're not touching the bottom, so there is a steady hum, but you can get very close to fish. You can absolutely stalk them. Redfish, um, no problem. Now, where you get in trouble is if you're hitting the bottom or hitting weeds, then it's very loud and they don't tolerate that. But the, the trick to the trolling motor is, is, you know, when you see fish or you're getting in the area, slowing down and running it on, on low speed. And when you're running it on low speed and you can keep the, the whole um, prop submerged, it's very quiet. Now, when you are keeping the whole prop submerged, Obviously, you're not going as shallow as you are when you're polling, right? So, you know, if if you really like fishing for tailing fish, 
you need a skiff then, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't, you really, I'm sorry, Robert, but you really can't fish for tailing fish with the towing motor, right? It's just too, I mean, too shallow. You'll be cutting you, them hard. You can in, you know, in, in places where there's like a, a trench or, or you know, a, a dip or a little bowl or something, and you can kind of get in there and, and go right along the edge of it, and you're just in, in water that's a little deeper than, than tailing depth, but just to your left or to your right is tailing depth. And, you know, we catch we catch plenty of of uh, a fish like that. Um, but you know, if your if your number one priority is to get up in the shallowest water that you possibly can, you know, a trolling motor and a bay boat's probably not for you. Um, but we're going to go over a couple of different things about, you know, I, I prepared some notes about the things that I think a skiff, you know, the pluses for the skiff, the negatives for the skiff, the pluses for the bay boat and the negatives for the bay boat. So I would start out by saying that no matter what your budget is, even if you have an unlimited budget, right? You, you have, which I don't, but go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Let's just say, let's just say you want to make this purchase and, and money is not an object and it doesn't matter how much it costs. And it, it doesn't even, that doesn't even matter. Every boat is a compromise. There is not a boat out there for any, do everything. No, there's not a boat that can do everything at, at any price. So if you want to go super shallow, but you also want to be able to go offshore on, on rough days, it's going to be really tough. You know, that's not going to be something that, that is doable because those boats do two completely different things. Going offshore, you know, has a deep V and displacement and you can go offshore in a big boat on any weather, but that boat is not designed to go in shallow water. That's the extreme end of the, of the spectrum. When you're going from a bay boat to a skiff, you know, like if you want, if your number one priority is getting super shallow, you know, then you're going to, you're going to, and that's where 90% of your fishing is. You're probably not going to enjoy a bay boat. That's probably not going to be a good boat for you because you're, you're going to eliminate 90% of, of what you like to do. But if you are different than that and you have, you're making choices because of your family, because of the number of people that you want to take, because of a lot of other kind of options that we're going to go into. Then you start looking at, okay, well, I can do 80% of the fishing that I want to do in this boat, and I'm only giving up 10%, and maybe I can go with a buddy, mm-hmm. or maybe I can, you know, do something for that. So, the, just, just this list that I came up with, you know, and this is how I kind of make a lot of decisions is, you know, you just yellow pad test, you know, you put, put a line down the middle, you've got, you got the, the, the good things on one side, you got the bad things on the other side, and then you just kind of decide what, what, how you want to do that. So a skiff, the, the positive things are very, it's very technical boat. You can, you know, you can get out there uh, with a buddy that knows how to pole and you can fly fish for permit, probably the most technical tarpon, whatever, redfish, you can get in super shallow water, very, very technical. You can spin it real quick. You can do, do all kinds of, of great things with it. That's fantastic. The downside to that is that you do need that buddy and they need to be able to pull. And if you're the only one that knows how to pull, then you're always going to be pulling. And you're pulling. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so it's really fun to take people fishing. You're just like a fishing guide. Um, in a skiff, most skiffs are like one person and you. Like you and one person. That's the ideal. You and two people is doable. You and three people kind of getting to a problem and even getting to whether that's Coast Guard legal in a lot of boats. So especially if they're big guys or something. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, take that with a family. Like we had, I had my wife and three kids and that's just not, that's just not a good combination on a, on a skiff. Plus um, one of the things that is a, is a positive for the skiff is it's extremely lightweight. The sides are very low. It's mostly deck. Um, and that's also a negative when you have kids. Right, because a a little kid can yeah, fall over. get their get their 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 waist up over the over the side. They lean over, their feet come out, just like the way that, that a kid falls in a bucket. You know, you wouldn't think you, you always see that little warning on the side of a five gallon mm-hmm. bucket. You're like, hey, what, what kind of kid's going to fall into a bucket? But it's really easy when you <laughs> see it happen. They just get they just get a little top heavy and they lean over and boom, they go right in. And I've seen people go right out of skiffs like that too. Um, so the low sides. That's a, that's kind of a problem. The number of passengers is kind of a problem for some people. 
but that's also really great for others. Like that's, those are, those are two completely different things. So the skiff is also great for fly fishing. Um, has, then this is where there's a big difference. There's a big difference in the amount of water it takes to jump on plane. Okay. So between a bay boat and a skiff. So if you're in shallow water, even if you're, even if you're fishing, like we're talking about where you're submerging the, the, the whole blade of the trolling motor and you're getting up in there and you've, you've gone for an hour up into shallow water, like snake bite area or something like that. You've, you, well, you can't use the trolling motor in there. So the bad example, but you can go in there and, uh, you go into an area and it's very shallow. Well, you're going to have to trolling motor all the way out where in a skiff, if you find a little pothole or you find just even just a smidge deeper water, a lot of skiffs can jump up on plane right there and, and not hurt the bottom and not do anything. So there is a big difference in, in jumping up on plane. That's one that people don't think about. Um, and, and that's, that's significant because, you know, now you're like, oh man, we're gonna. It's gonna take an hour to get out of here to jump up on plane where the, all the skiffs around you are jumping up and they're already fishing somewhere else. So the skiff can be very fast as well, but in a very fast skiff, it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's not like you want your kid riding at seventy miles an hour in the skiff. You know, five years old holding on. For yeah, life, yeah, right? yeah. So, so that's that's kind of that's kind of an issue with the skiff. Skiffs have um small live wells typically but they do have live wells a lot of times typically for shrimp and crabs and maybe for a bonefish release or a redfish release uh well um when you the other thing that might be a downside for a lot of people is when you're thinking about taking your family out there there's no shade in a skiff there's there's no shade at all so you can get shade in a bay boat that's something that um is a major factor for some people like your wife doesn't want to go out there unless there's shade or your kids are sensitive to the sun or somebody <coughs> needs to be in the shade. So that's, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. big deal. The, the skiff also, when you're talking about a trolling motor setup, um, now lots changed as we move into these lithium batteries, um, quite a bit lighter batteries and stuff. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're much lighter. They can be mounted on their sides and stuff like that. But for the most part, there's very little room in a skiff. So there's very little room for uh, bags, for tackle, for batteries, right? And then you then there's a real weight balance of where do you put the batteries? And if you and you can totally do it, but you might need to change the prop. You might need to change where where these batteries are, um, so that you get a good, you maintain a good smooth ride in a bay boat. Man, I think you can. We've had bay boats with batteries in the console. We've had bay boats with batteries up front. It doesn't seem to matter because the bay boat is Big enough. It's bigger. And so when you add weight to it, it doesn't affect the draft that much. Where if you have a, a small skiff, like a really small one, and you put two big guys in that skiff, that boat goes down immediately. Like it doesn't, there's not enough boat to displace this weight. So it goes down. So a boat that has this unbelievable draft when it's just you and one person, if you put a third person in there, you may not be able to go as shallow as a bay boat, right? Because that extra weight just sinks that boat down big time. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that's why most fishing guides, you ask them if you can take three people, they're like, no, uh, -uh. because everything that they have, that boat, that specialized boat it's specialized to perform with a certain amount of weight in it. And you put more weight in there than what's, what's, what it's good for. And that boat just goes straight down and they can't get to where they want to get. It's really hard to pull. All those things are, are issues. So um, a couple other things for the, um, for the, uh, the skiff. Um, they can be, it can be a little rough ride in some conditions where the bay boat, I've got some positives here. So one of the big things that I like about the bay boat is increased range with the larger fuel tanks. I can go anywhere. I can go anywhere I want to go. Like I can go offshore and come back inshore in the same day. I have big live wells. So if you like, if you like bait fishing. Like mullet all, or if you need some big bait yeah, fish. Yeah. You got mullet. Yeah. You can throw the net for pilchards. You can do anything. I have 150 gallons of live well in my, in my yellowfin. That's as much as an offshore boat. When you combine that with 
the 75 gallons of fuel that I have, I can, on a calm day, we can go out and go mahi fishing and come back in and go bone fishing. Like it's, it's very doable to do that. So in certain areas, that's something that a lot of people like. Like maybe one of your kids likes to offshore fish. The other one likes to inshore fish. Okay. Well, if you get a skiff, one person's just not happy. If you get a bay boat, it's possible on nice days. It's still a bay boat. It's not an offshore boat. It's a bay boat. So you got to really watch it. Mm-hmm. Um, with a bay boat, you have uh, more opportunity to get bigger electronics like radar. You can have radar. So, you know, that's, that's pretty nice for some people in some places, like especially Louisiana, where you're fishing the Mississippi River and it's foggy a lot of times. And then there's all that ship traffic there. Those guys use radar all the time. So there's not really a place for it. Uh, it's a more comfortable ride. Um, you, it's definitely more family friendly. The sides are higher. The cockpit's larger. Kids can have a great time in there. The bait well is not only good for keeping bait in there, but it's also probably the best entertainment for almost every kid that's ever been on any boat that I've owned. You get a live well full of shrimp or, or a live well full of pilchards. And they don't even want to fish, man. They want to play in the live well. They love it. It's yeah, your own aquarium. Yeah, it's like your own <laughs> aquarium. And they, you know, it's fantastic for them. And as long as everybody's having a good time, it's it's fantastic. Um, you can put more batteries in the in the thing without without um, uh, affecting its performance. Then the other thing that we we we're going to talk about um, is like the you were talking about the trolling motor and how how in your area there everybody's using a trolling motor. And then you were asking about, can you stalk fish with the trolling motor? And you absolutely can. But there's one thing that that's really important um, when you're when you're thinking about doing that. And it's also the ability to stop. Like that's something that you're not really thinking about a lot of times when you're with a push pole because of a school of fish is coming at you and you just put the push pole down and you stop the boat. So the push pole is good for pushing the boat and moving the boat, but it's also good for stopping the boat. And some people are doing it without even thinking about it. Like you can either stake out or you can push the pole forward and you can actually stop the boat. And in a lot of ways, stopping the boat is as important, if not more important than forward motion. So with a bay boat, we don't have a push pole. We use power poles. And the power pole is a fantastic invention that can quietly stop the boat. So if you have a school of redfish coming towards you and the wind is blowing at your back, if you don't stop the boat, you're going to get maybe one cast at this school of fish and the boat's going to blow right over the top of it and you're never going to see them again. But if you can stop on the outside of that school, you can make 20 casts into that school and you can catch fish after fish after fish. So stopping the boat is very, very important. With a skiff, I don't even know, real quick, yeah. so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but trolling motors, do they have reverse or no? They, is they it do just, have reverse. <clears throat> they do but have reverse, but it's or... incredibly loud. It's almost better just to spin the trolling motor all the way around. But even then, it's um, it's loud and it's not. it doesn't work as well. Like when you're pulling the boat along with the trolling motor, it is actually pulling it from the very tip of the boat. When you go to turn it around and try to back up, now your, 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 your trolling motor is at the very tip of the bow, pushing it backwards and it goes every which way, right? It's Uh, very tricky. It's very tricky. It's just much easier to just put that power pole down or even, you know, if, if, if you don't have a power pole, even just have somebody ready with the anchor and just put the anchor down or something down. They have like, you know, you can even stake the boat out. That's what we used to do before there were power poles, but the combination of the power pole and the trolling motor that's the fish catching combination to being able to stop, but also being able to, to move it along. So whether that's with a skiff or a bay boat, um, you need to be able to stop if you're going to have a trolling motor and you're going to be stalking fish and really trying, uh, to, to catch fish in that way. Stopping is huge. Now with a bay boat, I have two power poles. Um, and the two power poles is nice because you can imagine if the winds on your, on your, uh, left shoulder, and you're kind of going across the wind and you put the power pole down and cut the trolling motor immediately you're blowing around to the right right so the the wind will blow you right around when you have two power poles down you can keep the boat in the same attitude for the most part so when you. you blow okay. a 24 foot boat all the way around 
you might be 50 feet further away from the fish. Now you're out of casting range, right? So that's, that's tricky. So the twin power poles, that's, that's really good. Um, the shade, that's a, that's a good, um, positive for the bay boat. If, if you have so, people that need it. I do feel like the shade could be a positive or a negative. Yeah, I, I see your side, the positive. But if you're fly casting, yeah, no, it can be a it's problem. another thing to hit your, yeah. you hit your on your back cast. Yeah, that's a right? problem. So it could be so, positive or negative. Yes, and and but on the other hand, if you have um, a hard top, like we stand up on top of the hard top, so instead of being four feet off the deck on a skiff, I'm twenty feet in the air on the top of the hard top, and I can see fish that that people in a skiff can't see at all like it's it's that's are you really guiding amazing. up there are you fishing yeah. up there well, You're mostly you guiding. can you can guide up there and fish up there um but it's more more i mean you you're better off just to guide up there and so now the trolling motor is yeah, a remote yeah, yeah, control yeah, yeah. yeah so the remote the, the uh, trolling I motor you. i use has a remote control and we just you know i can be up on the up on the bow and i can also have a remote control for the for the power pole so I'm in total control of the boat standing 20 feet off the deck. It's pretty awesome. It really is. It's like flying in a helicopter. And it could be a, a diving board for the kids, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> it can be. So that's another, that's another positive. Um, but, you know, there's other things, you know, like I say, every boat's a compromise. So if you have that tower, yes, it gets in the way of fly fishing. Yes, it gets in the way of bridges, which this is a problem. And, and I often wonder when I, oh, buy, yeah, when I get yeah, a new yeah. boat, like we, we spend a lot of time at Hawks K. And, man, if it's blowing 25 out of the north and we just want to – or, or 25 out of the South is even better. And we just want to leave uh, Hawks K and we want to just go on the other side of the road right there. If you're in a skiff, you can, without even jumping on plane, you can idle, never get a drop of water on you, idle under one bridge, idle under the next bridge. And now you're on the, you're in the Lee and you can fish any, anywhere you want to. You never even jumped up on plane with a bay boat. We've got to go all the way around and under long key bridge. Everybody gets wet. It's not great with 25 from the South. So the, you know, and then there's, then there's other places where with a bay boat, you can't even access areas that you can in a skiff because you can't get under the bridge. So that's definitely something to consider whether you get a, or you could buy a bay boat without a tower, right? You could, without a, you uh, could but even, you could. but even then, yeah. you know, the bay boat without a tower, the console is still probably taller than the polling tower. So it's, oh, it's you, definitely something you. to consider. Um, so those are kind of the positives and negatives. Uh, so I don't know what questions you have. You probably got lots of questions now. Yeah, I've been thinking also, I mean, obviously uh, from, uh, you know, someone with a wife and two kids, a bay boat is definitely the way for me to go. It's just something I'm unfamiliar with, um, you know, because that way they could go fishing. We could go to the beach. They could go hopefully water skiing off it. Mm -hmm. But I do also juggle, you know, the the negatives or consider the negatives of a bay boat uh, the fuel cost is higher, yep. right? I mean, I feel like with, when I had a skiff in Miami, would, I would spend sometimes ten dollars, right. you know. And yep. obviously, the fuel cost is a lot higher with a with a bay boat. Um, trailering, like I feel like putting that tra the boat on a trailer, a skiff. I didn't even really know it was. I mean, I knew it was there, but like, but if you're trailering, I mean, do you trailer? You, yes. you said, I'm sorry, you have a 24 foot mm -hmm. bay boat. Yeah, it trailers great. It, it it trailers great. I can trailer. I've had a F150, and now I have an F250. The F-150 pulled it perfectly fine. It's definitely a larger boat. You definitely, you know, see it in both mirrors and in the in the yeah, rearview yeah, mirror. Yeah. You're looking at it. But honestly, it's it's not a it's not an issue to trailer. Um, the issue is can you park it in your garage? Because a bay yeah, boat, storage. a lot of times, you know, a lot of people can't park a boat on the street. They, it has to, if they have something, it has to fit inside the garage. And they do have trailers now that have this swing away tongue. Um, so you can cut a lot of, uh, of, of the overall length out of the whole rig when you have this tongue that swings back so that, you know, just for storage, <coughs> right? So you can swing like four feet of the trailer out of the way. And, you know, that will fit in some garages. But a 24 foot bay boat, you know, you got to have a place to put it. You know, that's, that's kind of the problem. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's I'm not the pay. I don't have space for off the pay somewhere. It's just in our expense. I have to find a place to store it. Right. Cause I can't fit it in my, my yard. But, um, another thing is, um, so when I, in Miami, it was a, a skiff. I had a steering wheel and a motor. And that's it. I had a handheld 
GPS and I had a handheld radio. So there's nothing to go wrong other than the steering. But I feel like maybe I'm hoping electronics have come a long way, but like, you know, with a with this bay boat, let's say you you know, wiring for your power pole, wiring for your trolling motor, wiring for your electronics, your radio. It's also a lot more things that could go wrong, right? I mean, yeah. whether you get rust in them or salt water, so or more things to to upkeep. Yes. Right. So they go like, oh, my radio's not working. Like I always had a handheld radio. Like it was it, you know, and, and well, you can still GPS, have that. So I mean, you can still build a bay boat the way backup. that you want to, and you can have instead of having you know the VHF inside the boat and ready to go, you can have you can have your handheld. You don't have the range on the handheld that you do on a on a on a boat with an antenna way with up antenna, on the top. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can keep them very um, very sparse, and I, I agree with you. I mean, my favorite boats are the ones that are absolutely the most simple. However, I'm also drawn to all these new things like, you know, when Lawrence comes out with with, you know, a, a new a new this active target that can shoot a beam out in front of you and you can actually see a fish like we can see tarpon swimming across the screen. Yeah, I want that. Right. And so yeah, in order really to cool. get that, yeah. you've got to yeah. you've got to do all this other stuff. So um, I'm drawn to all the technology, but I know in my heart that. The more stuff you put on a boat, the more stuff can go wrong with it. And the worst thing that you can do for a boat is not use it. The best thing you can do for a boat is to use it every single day. And when you use a boat every single day, like you get on a guide boat and that boat runs 300 days a year, basically it, stuff might be worn down, but it's not broken and it all works because he's using it every single day. And that's the best thing you can do for a boat to keep it functional. Um, but you're right. You know, the more stuff you have on a boat, the more stuff there is to go wrong. And it doesn't matter what that boat is and it doesn't matter what, um, how much it costs. Saltwater is tough on things. So, and especially electronics and electrical wiring and stuff like that. So you do get what you pay for when you go to a premium boat. Like if you look at the wiring on the yellow fin that we have, it's remarkable. Every wire you can, you can look at where it goes. You can follow it right down to the, to the switch panel. And you can see exactly what, instead of having just this big bundle of wires, right. And I've had boats <laughs> like that and it's like, there's a bundle of wires and if something goes wrong, good luck. So a really nice boat, typically they already know there's a chance that, you know, your bilge pump could go out. Let's make it really easy to fix. Let's, you know, there is a chance that you could blow a fuse somewhere. Let's make it really easy to find that so that you can get back going as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, those are, those are things that I consider too, when I'm buying, whether it's a skiff or, or a bay boat, you know, what, what does the wiring look like and, and what kind of attention to detail do they put into, um, the part of the boat that you're not seeing, because that's really the heart and soul of that boat. Gotcha. Gotcha. Another thing is, so it looks like looking at bay boats, they come from what I've seen in my mind, they come um, in three sizes, like roughly about 20 feet, 22 feet, 24 feet. And I'm just, uh, I think maybe like the 24, you, you have a 24, yes. but I think, I guess it's all trade-offs, right? I mean, I think to me, the 22 is more in my mind, more, more fits me better because of trailering. My, my car can only tow about 5,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. I think if you get the 24 with gas and everything, yep. you can, I don't want to exceed the towing capacity. And I think 20 is a little bit too small for me and my family and still might work, but 22 seems to be that middle, middle ground. Have, have you been able to use all three or just focus yep. on the bigger bay boats? Certainly have used all three over the, over the last, you know, 20, 20 years of, of owning bay boats. Um, the 22s typically, um, are are basically the 24 with two feet cut out of the middle of the of the boat and you usually sacrifice you know depending on the brand and this isn't across all brands because some people will have a very specific 22 and then the, it will be a different hull than the 24 but in the couple of different boat brands that i've spent a lot of time in the 22 is very similar to the 24 except you're going to usually sacrifice some live well storage and possibly have a smaller fuel tank in it um, but they can, they can be great. Now, a lot of people will decide that they want the 22 over the 24 because it can fit in their garage. That's one, 
you know, where, where it's a really, really big deal to somebody like you, like if you can fit that boat in your garage, now you don't have to pay storage on it. Now everything's easier. Right. So, but if, yeah, if yeah, it was yeah. a decision like that, I would absolutely go with a 22 over a 24 for, for that purpose. Um, you know, if you're, if you're just saying, you know, you can get whatever you want. Do you want the 22 or the 24? I'm probably going to go with the 24 cause it's got larger live well, larger fuel tank. And you know, it's, it's just a, a, a little bit bigger boat. And when you get to a boat like that, you're not going to see that the 22 is going to float in a lot shallower water than the 24. It's not like, it's not like a, between an 18 foot skiff and a 16 foot skiff. Like, you know, you can see that, gotcha. that can be, that can be a big difference. You know, like <laughs> some 16 foot skiffs are very, very, very small, like a, like a, a Bay or something <laughs> like that. They're tiny little boats. And then you go up to yeah. an 18 and like the difference between like a, a 16, uh, what is the boat I'm thinking about? What, what was that? The whip ray, the Hell's Bay whip yeah. ray 16. Yeah. And then you go up to like a, a, a Maverick or uh, 18, um, you know, Mirage 18. Those are two very different boats. They're one's bigger, way, one's way bigger and one's way smaller. Yeah, I had a Dolphin 18. It was really wide yeah. and, and stable. Or like stable, a 16 yeah, yeah. Dolphin Super Skiff. Like that is a small yeah, boat. Yeah, That's a difference. tiny little boat. And uh, Gypsy, it's, yeah. a, it's a great boat, but it's a very, very small boat compared to some of the 18s that are out there. So what do you think, not to get in the weeds too much with these, I don't know if you're familiar, but the, um, so I, I read about these, you know, these skiffs making this vacuum infused, mm -hmm. um, you know, hulls, yes. but I don't think that's translated over to the bay boat. Do you yes. know why that is? No, like, it, it is definitely, it, or, it is definitely certainly with the premium manufacturers. I mean, that's, that's absolutely the way that, that yellowfin does it. Um, and you can even go a step further. For and, all their bay boats, they do that. Yeah, I think okay, okay. Yeah, I mean okay. they they do. Which everything I guess gives like you. That. Well, you get you get really good. Um, I mean the the weight of a boat is uh is in the resin, right? So if you just dump a whole bunch of resin in a boat and you're and you you don't squeegee it out really well, that boat is going to be heavy, like a really heavy boat. And so over time, these skiff manufacturers, as they're as they're starting to um to try to eliminate weight out of this boat and make it float shallower and shallower and shallower, they would start to build them slightly different. And they're like, look, we don't need hundreds of gallons of resin in here. We just need to wet the, you know, get the, get the fiberglass Fibers or whatever. wet like it needs to with this. So there's, there's this bonding. And once you have that excess is only extra weight. So when you go to that vacuum uh, bag system, it pulls the resin right through the fiberglass and you get exactly how much you need, but not more. Right. And so it pulls a tremendous amount of weight out of the boat. And then when you start adding, you know, using different materials like carbon, you can even pull more weight out of the boat. So, I mean, I've, I, the boat that I have now is probably over a thousand pounds lighter than the boat that I had 10 years ago. And wow. Okay. That's, yeah. that's a big difference, especially with trailering and yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, and yeah. Then the way it floats and the way it rides and everything it's, you can, they, they have taken tremendous amount of weight out of, out of these boats these days. And, and all manufacturers are doing a better job of, um, you know, getting rid of excess resin, but also reducing human error and uh making a making a really good boat so that is translating over not to all brands but to the premium brands they're definitely they're definitely using the vacuum bag i'm curious you keep your bay boat on a trailer primarily or would you put it in the water and at a dock somewhere um i i don't like to leave any boat in the water it, we have a lift at hawks <laughs> k um so there's a there's a boat on the lift at hawks k my bay boat stays on a trailer the skiff stays on a trailer I like a trailer. I I was a trailer guide. Me too. Me um, too. Yeah. I I don't really like keeping a boat in the same exact place. I like to be able to move, and on and I use the trailer in the bay boat and the skiff. I use a trailer as a tool in the Florida Keys, where if it's really blowing, I can choose a a boat ramp. And we can go and fish a couple little spots there and then put the boat back on the trailer all in the course of, of the day and then trailer down 20 miles, hit another boat ramp, fish a little bit around there, all while everybody's staying. I mean, I just don't see any reason why it's blowing 30 
to beat the hell out of your customers, right? When you can just put it on the trailer and just drive down the keys, everybody's happy. You're comfortable. You put the boat back in the water. I mean, it, there, there've been many days where I'll, I'll take the boat out and put it back in, you know, maybe two or three times in the course of a day to keep everybody more comfortable and to fish for the kind of fish that we, we want to fish for. Now, if you're going to the Marquesas, you don't have that opportunity. So you just got to, mm -hmm. or the Everglades or something like that. Like, Sometimes you got to just suck it up and take the, take the rough ride, but you know, but I'm the same way. We, but when I was at University of Miami, we had docks and we'd, we keep the boat there, but I couldn't, I couldn't sleep well at night. I no. would just be like so afraid of the bilge pump stop working or anyway, I'm, I'm a huge fan of trailering. Um, but, so here's the, the last topic I have, which is kind of a the negative heartbreaking one cost yes i mean to buy a new boat it looks like they're for these bay boats and don't get me wrong they're they're phenomenal boats i watch the videos i see them at boat shows they've really come a long way and i just sit there and i drool looking at them but you're looking at six figures to buy a new one i mean i'm definitely not going to buy a new one but it just it kind of sits there like breaks my heart like i could never buy that new boat you know i could with, yeah. with my income i could never like to me six figures is what I spend for a house. Right. You know, so <laughs> yeah. And they've got, no, I mean, I know there's gotten more and more market, expensive, but, but the, yeah. the used, you know, used boat is, is there's nothing wrong with it, especially if you're going with a premium manufacturer, I would rather have a used boat from a premium manufacturer than a brand new boat from a, not a premium manufacturer, because, you know, once you like, if you were to get a, a used boat, say it's 10 years old, and you put a new motor on that and you fix whatever wiring issues there are, you've got a brand new boat. Like that's a great mm -hmm, boat. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're talking about like a yellowfin or something like that, those boats, they last, they really, really last. Now the motor needs to be replaced. The trolling mm -hmm. motor batteries need to be replaced. The how often do you change that to trolling motor batteries? Like every five years yeah, or so? Or I mean, like my car that, batteries that every be, five years. Yeah, that'd be good. And it depends on how okay. much you you know, any kind of battery use it. is gonna have a a number of of recharging cycles, just like your cell phone, right? Like yeah, you know, if you just yeah. charge yeah. your cell phone every single day, it, it only can do that so many times before the battery just won't do it anymore. So um it, you know, if you're, if you're using it a whole bunch and it, you, you need to change them out more often than maybe somebody that doesn't use it as much. Um, but you know, the, those are the things that I look at is like, you know, your outboard for sure. Like if you had an old boat with a new outboard, you're good to go, man. You're good to go. There's, I, I've got one of my favorite boats in the keys is a, is, is a, uh, is our, uh, underwater cameraman's boat. And that boat is 30 years old. He just puts new motors on it and it's fine. It's perfectly fine. And what is it? Uh, you don't mind me asking, what is it? That's a 28 whitewater. Um, you know, whitewater. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's not a bay boat or, or a skiff. So that's kind of a, an offshore boat. It's a small offshore boat. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's just the, what I like about that boat is that it stands the test of time. Like that is, that boat has been out there in every weather condition and, and it's fine, but you know, the, the, uh, they throw no new motors on it and, and it's a, it's good to go. And so the, when, when you're getting a used boat, you know, the, the number of hours on the motor is, is really, that's a, that's a big factor. And, you know, maybe if you get a really good deal on it, then you can afford to put a new motor on, on an old boat and you're, you're good to go, man. That's a, that's a great, that's a great choice. Gotcha. Well, I'll look for definitely a used one and maybe someday I'll come down in price, but I doubt they ever, the new ones ever will, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the world we live in. Yeah. So, but no, thanks Tom. Thanks. Okay, you answered well, all my questions. Now, now you've those. made, now you have a choice uh, that that's even harder now that you, now that you understand this, but you know, I think the big, yeah. the big takeaway is that no matter, no matter what the budget, every boat's a compromise and, you know, when you're, when you're looking to go into a new boat, whether, whether you're getting out of a big boat and going into a skiff, there's an adjustment period or the other way around, whether you're getting out of a, out of a, a skiff and going into a bay boat, you know, there's an adjustment period and it's going to feel really big and it's going to feel like, Whoa, I don't, you know, I don't, this is too much boat or this is too much boat for the area that I'm trying to fish in or, but you know, if you just spend a little time in it, it, it all, it all becomes more comfortable and you know, the bay boat, 
Babe, that's a nice ride. I mean, your your family's gonna like it. I, mean, I promise you that. Like that's yeah, it's definitely yeah, yeah, more my, of a family my, boat. I don't think my checkbook will, but I think the family will. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, good luck with your decision. Let me know if I can help any further. And I'm sure all of you guys might have questions as well. If you do, you can always text 305-930-7346. You can ask those questions and maybe it will spark a episode just like this one with Mike. Um, all right. That's a bay boat versus a skiff. We'll be back next week for another episode of How To Tuesday. See you.